Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the 2021 RDS Public Law Series. Over a series of four lectures, Datuk Sri Hishamuddin Yunus, whom we respectfully refer to as Judge Hisham at our office, and other prominent speakers, Professor Dr. Dr. Asmi Sharom, Datuk Dr. Asmi Abra uh, Prasad Abraham, and Tan Sri Muhammad Arif Yusuf, will discuss about the interaction of the public law and our private lives. In particular, how the public law safeguards the private citizens against the state. We are extremely honored and humbled to have Duli Yang Maha Mulia, Yang Di Pertuan Besar of Negeri Sembilan, Tuanku Mukris Ibni Almarhum Tuanku Munawe, to officiate this lecture series. By way of a brief introduction, Tuanku read law at University of Riverspeed and presently is the only Malay ruler with legal background. We will now play the royal address by Tuanku Mukris Ibni Almarhum Tuanku Munawe, delivered from Istana Hingap, Seremban. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh and good afternoon. I am pleased to officially launch the public law series with Datuk Sri Muhammad Ishamuddin Yunus. This is a discourse on the federal constitution featuring Datuk Sri Hishamuddin Yunus and other prominent legal luminaries. Due to present circumstances, this public lecture is conducted as a webinar using online conference facility. I would like to record my appreciation to Dr. Sri Hishamuddin Yunus and the partners of the law firm, Bruce Lee Dahalan Saravana Partnership, for inviting me to grace the virtual launching of this public lecture. I am made to understand that this public law series is organized by the firm to foster greater awareness and encourage discussion among Malaysians, especially the younger generation, on the fundamental values that the federal constitution embraces. This series is held at this time to commemorate Hari Merdeka and Hari Malaysia. A concise statement on the federal constitution was made by my late grandfather, His Majesty Almarhum Tuanku Abdul Rahman Ibn Almarhum Tuanku Muhammad, our first young Dipertuan Agong. He was an English trained barrister, and this background put him in good stead to be the first sovereign of the newly independent nation. It gives me a great privilege to share here a short excerpt from the royal address delivered by His Majesty on the occasion of the opening of the first parliament of the Federation of Malaya on 12 September 1959. This constitution is a guardian of the rule of law. It protects the integrity, the freedom for influence, and the independence of our courts and our judges and our law officers and the members of our various commissions of the public service responsible for appointment and discipline. In this way, it ensures the security, integrity, and impartiality of the civil service. The constitution belongs to all of us. It belongs to us as the young Deputan Agong. It belongs to you as members of parliament. It belongs to the people as the fount of power. This excerpt merits close attention. It encapsulates the importance of the federal constitution in governing the various facets of our democratic society. The federal constitution functions not only as a source of authority for good government, but also as a guardian of judicial independence and fundamental liberties. Tato Sri Shamudin, as a judge for almost 23 years, always upheld the federal constitution. As I said before, at the book launch of Hishamuddin Yunus, celebrating judicial independence, although he sat on the bench during some of the turbulent times in our judiciary in recent years, 
Datuk Seri Hishamuddin Yunus served the nation with utmost integrity, true to his judicial oath. His steadfast allegiance to the Federal Constitution and being true to himself is the guiding light of his over 700 judgments, where some of the landmark decisions will be discussed in this public law series. I firmly hope that the legal thoughts and legacy of Datuk Sri Hishamuddin Yunus will continue to inspire judges and lawyers alike, present and future, to uphold judicial independence as he did at all times. I am pleased to launch this public law series virtually, which I hope all participants will find beneficial and encourage further discourse among Malaysians in appreciating the federal constitution. I congratulate the law firm, Rosli Dahlan Saravana Partnership, for taking the initiative to host this series. With the grace of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I now declare open the public law series with that thought Sri Muhammad Ishamuddin Yunus. We are very grateful to His Royal Highness. The guest speaker for the inaugural session today is none other than the Dato Sri Gopal Sri Ram. Judge Gopal Sri Ram, it's a great honor for us to host you here today. Judge Gopal Sri Ram was having a very successful career as a lawyer before he decided to leave practice in the 1990s to serve the nation as a judge, as a court of appeal judge. During his 16 years on the bench, he has written numerous judgments, which, which would be cited by thousands of reported cases, many of which would go into the legal textbooks and into the syllabus of the Malaysian law degree. It would, be a, it would not be an exaggeration for us to say that Judge Gopal Sri Ram is our very own Lord Denning, who had done great service in developing the domestic law. Having retired in 2010, Judge Gopal Sri Ram continues to be active in the national legal scene. The country continues to benefit from his legal expertise, where in recent years, he was appointed as the lead prosecutor for the 1MDB cases. Today, the lecture is titled Right to Property under Article 13 of the Federal Constitution. Judge Hisham, it gives me great pleasure to now pass the floor over to you. Thank you, moderator Mr. Hayden Tan, South Jastra and good afternoon to all members of the audience. Welcome to our webinar on personal law. First and foremost, I would like to say thank you to His Royal Highness, the young diplomatist of Negris Milan, Tuanku Mukhris Ibni Almarhum, Tuanku Munawir, for kindly officiating this webinar and for His Highness kind and inspiring words. Patik menyujung kasih, Tuanku. I would like to congratulate my firm, Rosalie Dahlan Saravana Partnership for organizing this webinar, as well as to thank the firm for inviting me to be the keynote speaker. I would also like to thank my learned brother, that's a Sri Gopal Sri Ram, former federal court judge, for being with us this afternoon to share his knowledge and his thoughts on the subject that we are going to discuss. Sri, it is a, indeed a privilege to have you with us. This afternoon, Dr. Sri Gopal Sri Ram and myself will be discussing Article 13 of the federal constitution, that is the fun fundamental rights to property. Rights to property has always been considered as part 
of men's natural rights and were considered important enough to be enshrined in constitutional documents like the Magna Carta. Let me say a few words about the Magna Carta. Magna Carta are 13 words. It means a big charter. Magna means big, Carta means charter, the big charter. In term, 13th century England, there lived a king by name of King John. And he was um, a, a tyrannical and cruel judge and abused his people. The people rose against him and forced him to sign a kind of a document, a kind of a guarantee, an agreement, which is called the Magna Carta. In this uh, agreement, he has to guarantee his, his citizens, he has to guarantee his, his citizens certain basic rights, rights to life, rights to liberty, and also a right to property. And let me share to you what is written in the Magna Carta. In its original form, it is written in Latin, but what you will see on the screen is the English translation. It says, no free man shall be arrested or detained in prison or deprived of his freehold or in any way molested. And we will not send forth against him, nor set against him unless by the lawful judgment of his peers or by the law of the land. Moving forward, we'll come to the year of 1948 after the Second World War, and we have the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Right to property is also entrenched in, in this Universal Declaration of Human Rights in the form of Article 17. I will share with you, it says, Article 17, Clause 1, everyone has the right to own property alone as well as in association with others with others clause two no person no one shall be arbitrarily deprived of his property now our constitution have its roots in magna carta how did it come about because the when the british came to our shores, they brought along with them the spirit of Magna Carta. And therefore, it is natural when our forefathers dr drafted the constitution, they incorporate into the constitution certain fundamental liberties based on the Magna Carta, uh, right, like right to life and liberty, as well as rights to uh, property. Now, and the house, this rights to uh, property in Article 13 of the Federal Constitution. If, if you go to the, uh, the fundamental liberties of our Federal Constitution, you can find Article 13 is the last clause in that part. And, and our Article 13 states, Article 13, Clause 1, no person shall be deprived of his, uh, of his property save in accordance with the law. And Article and Clause 2 says, no law shall provide for the compulsory acquisition or use of property without adequate compensation. I will discuss with you first, number one, what is the meaning of property in Article 13? There is, you find that you, you, you go through the question, you find there is no definition of property. So in my view, we have to give property 
its ordinary, ordinary meaning. Right? And um, I shall begin with what a Professor Sheridan means by Article 13. In his article, The Mysterious Case of Disappearing Business, which you can read in 1977 uh, JMCL, General Omission Comparative Law. Is, Professor Sheridan says, in Article 13 of the Constitution of Malaysia, the word property is not used in a special sense. It means what people can own, buy and sell, give a security for debts, use, wear out, improve, give away, destroy, settle on trust, live by will, or succeed to an intestacy. And uh, I will now take you to the Supreme Court of India, where in the case called Dwarkardas Srinivas against the Shola Force Spinning and Weaving Company Limited, there is um, an endeavor by the Supreme Court to define what is meant by uh, property in Article 31 of the uh, Indian constitution, which is equivalent to our Article 13. I shall read, quote, having regard to the setting in which Article 31 is placed, the word property used in the article must be construed in a wider sense as connoting a bundle of rights, accessible, accessible by the owner in respect thereof and embracing within its purview both corporeal and incorporeal rights. First thing, the, the court says it must be given the, the widest, uh, uh, interpret in the widest sense. Number two, it includes corporeal and incorporeal rights, meaning it shall include both movable and immo immobile property. And this wide interpretation of the word property was adopted by our federal court in the case of Selangor pilot, uh, decided in the year 1977, which I will allude to later in this uh, discussion. Now, talking about the meaning of property, uh, uh, interesting question arises in the case of uh, Selangor Pilot, whether a person's business goodwill, business goodwill is a property. And now both the federal court and the private council in the Selangor Pilot case hold the view that business goodwill is property for the purpose of Article 13. And we'll discuss more of this later. Next. I will discuss what is meant by the expression safe in accordance with the law in clause one of article 30. Does it mean any law as long as duly passed by parliament? Or does it mean that a law that has some element of natural justice? Our federal court say, says in the case of in, a, of, of in, in one case known as Arun Mugam Pile, the, our federal court says law means simply any law as long as it's duly, duly passed by parliament. In Arun Mugam Pile, Chief Justice Gill has this to say, and I shall quote, says, Whenever a competent legislature enacts a law in, in excess of any of its legislative powers, destroying or otherwise depriving a man of his property, the latter is precluded from questioning its reasonableness by invoking Article 13, Clause 1 of the Constitution, however arbitrary the law might probably be. Not the, the last phrase, however arbitrary the law might probably, probably be.
Then we can have the case, our federal court case of Kula Singham. An attempt was made uh, by the landowner. An attempt was made by the landowner whose land was acquired to persuade the court to rule that law in clause one means law with an element of natural justice in it. In this case of Kula Singham, the focus was on the Land Acquisition Act 1960, which does not provide for pre-acquisition hearing. The Act only provides to a right of hearing upon on determining the quantum of compensation. And in this in trying to persuade our federal court to say that law in plus one means natural justice, the law that has an element of natural justice in it. The, our, our, the, the landowner in Kula Singham referred to one Singapore case, a private council case called Ong Ah Chuan. In Ong Ah Chuan, Lord Diplock says, quote, in accordance with the law, refers to a system of law which incorporates those fundamental rules of natural justice that have formed part and parcel of the common law of England. In other words, it must incorporate rules of natural justice. Now, Ong Achuan was a drug trafficking case emanating from Singapore and concerned the interpretation of the word law in the context of Article 9 of the Singapore Constitution on right to life and liberty equivalent to Article 5 of course, which is equivalent to Article 5 and Clause 1 of our federal constitution. But our federal court was not impressed was with the argument and brushed Ong Achuan aside, saying, quote, Ong Achuan dealt with the question of presumptions and burden of proof. And over the court proceeded to hold that the Land Acquisition Act does not in any way violate Article 13, Clause 1, although it does not provide for a pre acquisition hearing. Justice in delivering the judgment of the federal court in Kula Singham says the legislature can by clear words, exclude the principles of justice in the absence of specific personal guarantee. Now, the third thing I'd like to discuss about Article 13 is the relationship between Clause 1 of Article 13 and Clause 2 of that article. You will recall Clause 1 says, no person shall be deprived of his property safe in accordance with the law. And clause two says, no law shall provide for the acquisition or use of property without adequate compensation. Now the question arises, does every deprivation of property under clause one will result in acquisition or use of property under clause two and therefore calls for adequate compensation? The question is answered in the affirmative yes by the federal court in the Slango Pilot case. In Slango Pilot, the, our federal court relied on an Indian authority called Sagir Ahmad against the state of Uttar Pradesh held that whenever a legislation is passed to deprive a person of his property, even if indirectly acquisition of property of that person is deemed to have taken place, and clause two is automatically violated if the legislation does not at the same time provide for adequate compensation. However, on appeal to the private uh, private council, the private council is agreed 
with the federal court. The federal the Privy Council held that a legislation that deprives a person of property under clause one does not necessarily result in the acquisition or use of property of that person in clause two. Now I'll come to specific cases. The first case I will touch upon is the government of Malaysia, again, the Slangor Banner Association, a case which I've mentioned several times earlier. On the screen, there you see a port Swetanam. That was the name of the port uh, before it was changed to Port Klang in 1972. It's named after Frank Swetanam. Frank Swetanam, the the great, uh, great uh, famous uh, British, uh, colonial administrator who was the architect of, of the Federation of Malaya, the Federated Malaysia Agreement of 1895 and the first resident general of the Federated Malaysia. So, so in 1972, it became to be known as Fort Blanc. But when this happened, it was known as um, Port Sutinum. What happened was in 1969, six pilots got together and formed an association, and they call the association the Selangor Pilots Association. Now they they had a, a, a monopoly of the um, the pilotage a service services of in the Port Klang. Now you will ask. What is a pilotage service? Now you are dealing with pilots, not airplane pilots, but sea pilots. What the pilot does is that whenever a ship approach a port, a clang, before the, the, the ship could, could, could uh, come close to the port, the pilot will, will go on his own small boat, own small boat, a boat will both embark on the ship and will the guide the ship as close as possible uh, to the port where it is safe and appropriate to, to berth the ship, right? The, because the pilot knows which are the, the parts in the sea um, to avoid, which are the shallow part of the sea to, to avoid for safety reasons, right? So they, have, they, they formed this uh, association they, and they did this business and it was a good, a good business and they acquired goodwill. Now, something happened in the year 1972. In 1972, the government through parliament amends the Port Authority Act of 1963. It changed the name from Port Sweden to Port Klang, but in, apart from that, the parliament also introduced a new section, namely section 35A in the act. Now, this provision, number one, it prohibited, prohibited pilots from doing pilotage services unless is employed by the port authority. Number two, it pro prohibited ships entering Port Klang from employing pilots from the association. All ships entering the port can only, could only employ pilots employed by the port authority. So as a result of the introduction of this section, the, option, the association could no longer create their business. In other words, they were legislated out of business. The association sold their launches to the port authority and also their ships and their equipments and most of their pilots joined the, uh, the, the, the port clung authority as a port authority pilots. Now, the Selangor pilot station claimed from the government for 
compensation for what is what they call for loss of business goodwill loss of business goodwill so the claim was dismissed by the high court but the federal court allowed the claim however the private council allowed the appeal by the government and dismissed the claim now several important question arises from this case right number one whether the business goodwill was property the high court declined to answer this question saying that there was no deprivation of property in the first place however both the federal court and the private council answered the question in the affirmative yes business goodwill is property for the purpose of article 38 second question whether the goodwill had been acquired by the authority yes says the federal court but no said the private council now i will take you to the reasoning of the judgment i begin with the our federal court which says yes there was a a, a goodwill acquired by the authority at the federal court chun sufian the law president said could the plaintiffs had been legislated out of business while it is true that they were not deprived of the physical assets of their business nonetheless nevertheless they have suffered an abridgment of the incidence of its ownership they have been deprived of the business of supplying quality service in port certain though only by a negative or restrictive provision interfering with the enjoyment of their property and court so our federal court found in favor of the slango pilot pilot association and and said that they had been deprived of their property and there had been an acquisition of that property by the government however on appeal by the government the private council overruled the, the federal court at the private council a one law lord by the name of viscount dilhorn delivering the majority judgment see at the federal uh, there were five judges at the private council four against one the majority were four judges yeah the majority said i quote yeah lordships agree that the person may be deprived of his property by a mere negative or restrictive provision but it does not follow that such a provision which leads to deprivation also leads to compulsory acquisition or use and the private, private council went on to hold in relation to article 13 clause 2 the question to be answered is was any property of the association compulsory acquired or used by the port or authority only if there was could there have been a failure to comply with article 13 plus 2. The private council then went on to take the view that the goodwill was not acquired by the authority from the association. Hence, there was no violation of article 13 plus 2. Plus two. Accordingly, no compensation was payable. However, there was a dissenting judgment at the private council 
in the form of the dissenting judgment of Lord Salmon. Lord Salmon said that he agreed with the federal court. He agreed with the federal court and goes on to say, I am, however, entirely convinced that the amending act of 1972, there's the act that amend, amended the Port Authority Act, and it's just a section 35, capital A. The act, the amending act did provide indirectly, but inevitably for the compulsory acquisition without compensation of the respondent's property by the authority and therefore contravene Article 13, Clause 2 of the Constitution. Then next, the third question is whether the respondents, that is the Slango Pilot Association, were entitled to compensation. Yes, it says the federal court, and we have gone through this, and no, said the private council. Now, whose judgment was the better judgment, the federal court's judgment, or the private council judgment by majority? Well, you are the judge. Next, I'll come to a case known as called the Ismail Baka and others against the director of lands and mines, Kadar. It is a case heard by a panel of appeal on which I said the decision was in the year 2010. It's a case of farmers whose parcels of land were acquired by the state authority. In fact, that there were three parcels. Yeah. So a compensation was awarded. They, they waited for the money, one year, two years, three years, the money was not forthcoming. Only nine years later, they received a letter from the land office saying, come over to the land office and collect your compensation check. The farmer says to the land office, no, thank you. It's far too late. We don't want the compensation. We want our land back. You have violated the constitution by not paying us compensation promptly. You have violated clause one of the federal constitution uh, of article 13, which says that no person shall be deprived of his property safe in accordance with the law. But what you did, the state of the state of the was not in accordance with the law. Section 29 of the land acquisition says that, I, I can see down the screen, section 29 says, the land administrator shall, as soon as may be, make payment for each amount awarded entitled thereto. The word there, as soon as may be. What does as soon as may be means? According to the, the landowners, they say it must be, you know, made uh, as soon as, as possible, promptly, but not nine years later. So in, in so arguing that there has been a violation of Article 1, they referred, the landowners referred to two cases. Huh? One is the case of come in pick. In come in, no, sorry, the case of Ong Ging, Ong Gek Ki. In the case of Ong Gek Ki, there was a, de a delay of seven years to hold an inquiry, uh, not to pay conversation, yeah, a delay of seven years to hold an in inquiry to determine compensation uh, from the date of the notice of acquisition. So the federal court says that a delay of seven years to hold an inquiry was unreasonable and therefore was not in accordance with clause one of Article 13, 
And therefore, it is a violation of Article 13. There is another case uh, called Kam Yin Fei, and it was a, also a delay to hold an inquiry for seven years. Um, but in Kam Yin, Yin Fei, the decision was doesn't revolve on Article 13, but revolve on administrative law and unreasonable interpretation of the word uh, of, of uh, Section 29 of the Land Acquisition Act. So it, it just was based on uh, on administrative law remedy, uh, not based on the Constitution. But nonetheless, the 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 court uh, it is in fact a private council decision in Kangin Bay. The private council says that seven years uh, was too, too long a delay and was unreasonable. So the acquisitions in both in, in the Ongeki and Kam Ginpek were quashed. And the land acquired were restored to the respective landowners. So the landowners rely on these two cases. Now, on the part of the state legal advisor, he said, this is a very interesting, um, a, a strange of argument. He said, as soon as may be, uh, does not mean at convenient speed. Uh, it, it means as soon as the land administrator was able to pay. This is a rather a strange uh, reasoning, meaning that if the land officer was only able to pay 20 years later, then he can make the payment of 20 years later and that will be legal. So that is his argument. And he relied on one case called Tan Bun Ba, again, the state government officer of Para, decided in 1983. In that case, there was a delay of seven years. Seven, seven seems to be a, a very popular number, isn't it? There was a delay of seven years in making payment. The High Court judgment, the High Court held that as soon as maybe means as long, as soon as the land administrator was able to pay. However, the Court of Appeal, that is my panel, rejected the argument and decided to follow on get key and come in big and decided that Tan Bun Bak was not a good president and refused to follow that decision. We ruled at the Court of Appeal that the nine year delay was clearly unreasonable and was not in accordance with the law and hence a violation of Article 13, Clause 1. Now I'll come to my third and the last case uh, this afternoon. This is a case called E. Chong Pang against the land ancestor of the district of Alugaja. This is an acquisition of land in Alugaja by the tree, by, by the state authority for the purpose of slope maintenance. In E. Chong Pang, there was an omission on the part of the land administrator to issue form A as required by section four, subsection one of the Land Acquisition Act. Now I shall read to you what section four, subsection one says. It says, whenever the state authority is satisfied that any land in any locality in the state is likely to be needed for any purposes, refer to in clause section three, a notification in form A shall be published in the Gazette, not the word, shall be published in the Gazette. And then clause two says, the land administrator shall give public notice of any land notification, of, of any notification published under subsection one in the manner prescribed by section 52. Now, in this case, the land owners argue that there was a violation of Article 13, Clause 1, as 
by reason of the word a code form A shall be published. Therefore, the publication of form A was mandatory. Mandatory. The claim was dismissed by the High Court on the grounds that notwithstanding the word shall in subsection one, the publication of Form A is merely directory and not mandatory. And the High Court relied on the majority judgment in the case of Ng Kim Moy against Pentadbir Tanah Daerah Seremban. The, at a court of appeal of, of which I presided, we unanimously allowed the appeal having the opinion that the publication of Form A was mandatory and not merely directory. Based on basing on the minority judgment of Justice Kopas Rira in Ng Kim Moy. Earlier on, the High Court was relying on the majority judgment in Ong Kim Moy, whereas we, at, at the court appeal, we, we, we rely on the dissenting judgment of Justice Kovac Ram in the same case. I won't go deeply into this case because um, Justice Kovac Ram, uh, my learned brother, uh, the Tusik of Ram will be dealing, uh, dealing in this case later in our discussion this afternoon. But I just want to say this. this it is that unfortunately, the decision of the Court of Appeal was reversed by the Federal Court. The Federal Court, without writing any written judgment, decided that, um, yeah, you can see that on the screen. Yeah. Yeah. What the federal court first posed the question whether a notice in Form A under Section 41 of the Land Action Act must be issued first by the state authority before the state authority can issue the, not the notice acquisition Form B under uh, Section 4, Section 1 of the Land Acquisition Act. And the federal court then goes on to answer it very briefly. It says, having heard the respective submissions from both sides, this court unanimously answers the question in the negative. Under the Land Action Act 1960, the state authority can proceed to issue the notice in Form D under Section 1 without having to issue the notice in Form A under Section 4 Section 1 of the Act. This is most unfortunate in view of the divergence of opinions among judges. The federal court should have written, should have issued a written judgment. Until today, no written judgment had been issued. With that, I end my presentation. Thank you for listening, and I'll be happy to answer questions later. Thank you, Judge Shisham. Thank you, Judge Shisham, for briefly touching on the definition of law, property, and the issue of delay, as well as briefly on the procedure of Land Acquisition Act. We now, with great honor, we invite Dr. Sri Gopal Sri Ram, who will speak on unique status of the right of property, as well as the natural justice in the context of the right of property. We pass the floor to Dr. Sri. Dr. Sri.
Mike. Double tree. Uh, I believe that should that some issue with your microphone. Can we hear? Can we invite him again? Just uh, see anyone to assert him? Uh, his office, in the office. Uh, Dato Sri is aware, but we. Yeah. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yes. yes sir. <laughs> All right. Uh, I'll start again. Good afternoon to all. Uh, it's a great pleasure for me to be here and thank you so much for inviting me to participate in this webinar. I won't be very long. There are only two points I'd like to make. The first is this, the meaning of the word property. My learned brother has uh, adverted to it in his, during his uh, address. I just want to add to say that uh, after the jurisprudence from 1994 uh, as to the interpretation of fundamental rights in the Constitution, uh, <clears throat> the tendency has been to interpret words in the fundamental rights provisions liberally, widely. So uh, in the federal court, we have held in a trilogy of cases uh, that fundamental rights in the constitution are to be read liberally, widely. So for that reason, the word property would include both tangible and intangible property. If the decision, if the facts of Slango Pilot Association were therefore to recur today, it would be decided differently. There is no question, of course, in anyone's mind that Lord Salmon was right and that Viscount Dillon, who never decided a case against a government in his life, was wrong. Uh, any government was wrong. The importance of interpreting property widely is to enable courts to reach remedial justice in areas where there is a doubt whether or not there's been an infringement of a fundamental right. After the decision of the Supreme Court in Dewan Untangan Negri and Nordin, the test which previously applied on the question of whether there had been uh, deprivation, that for deprivation there must be actual deprivation no longer exists because the test now is whether the legislation directly impacts upon the fundamental right. If it impacts upon the fundamental right, then there is a violation. Question is not whether there's a deprivation, whether there's an impact upon the fundamental right. So again, the position has changed. Now, what happens then if a person is deprived of property? Uh, can he be deprived of property in breach of rules of natural justice? Uh, Kulasingam, the case which was referred to by my learned brother, says that statute can exclude the rules of natural justice. That is not correct. Because at the time Kulasingam was decided and uh, it was Arumgum Pillay was still holding the field. 
Arunudam Pillai was uh, actually following the decision of a court inside the Supreme Court of Burma. If you look at the judgment in that case, you will find reference to a judgment of the Supreme Court of Burma by Justice Chang Mintat. And that there, the, the Burmese Supreme Court followed the judgment of the Indian Supreme Court in the case of Gopalan against the state of Madras, where the majority view, Justice Fazil Ali, in a, excluding Justice Fazil Ali, who delivered a powerful dissent, held that the word law in Article 21 of the Indian Constitution, which says that no person shall be deprived of his life or personal liberty save in accordance with procedure established by law, the word law there meant written law. And that is exactly what Justice Gill, Chief Justice Gill held in the Arunapalli case, because they just followed uh, the decision in, uh, uh, of the Indian Supreme Court. The change came, however, in a series of decisions beginning from 1973 right up to 1978, 1970, 1970 to 78. Uh, beginning with the Express Newspapers case and then the, the list of cases are all discussed in my judgment in the Lee Kuan Wo case. Uh, the Sarkar case and then Shambhunath Sarkar against State of West Bengal and uh, Cooper, R.C. Cooper against the Union of India and culminating in the judgment of the Indian Supreme Court in Maneka Gandhi against the Union of India. So the important thing is that in Maneka Gandhi, the unanimous uh, Supreme Court there adopted the dissent of Justice Fazil Ali in, <clears throat> followed the dissent of Justice Fazil Ali in A.K. Gopalan. Those of you who are interested in reading A.K. Gopalan, you will find it reported in AIR 1950, uh, Supreme Court, page 27. I commend to you first the judgment of the dissenting judgment of Justice Fazil Ali. But that is the law today. Now, our federal court, in after the decision in Dewan Undangan Negri, has uh, followed. Uh, uh, after the Supreme Court followed uh, Manika Gandhi in, 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 uh, in uh, the Devan Undangan Nagri case, our court, our apex court has followed the, uh, that principle, has applied that principle, and it culminated in the judgment of the nine, man, nine justice bench in Alma Nudo, and the public prosecutor, where the unanimous federal court of nine justices held that law did not mean any enacted law, does not mean any enacted law, but it means a law which is just, fair, and reasonable, which must meet the test of proportionality contained in the second limb of Article 8.1 of the Federal Constitution. So to say that you can exclude the rules of natural justice by statute can no longer be true, that statement in of law by Justice Abdul Kader in Kulasinga must now be regarded as per incurian. It cannot stand together with the later jurisprudence. That is notwithstanding the efficient work of the constitutional wrecking crew presently housed in the federal court, which has succeeded, succeeded in overturning itself several times, reversing itself several times, in holding that the basic structure doctrine is not part of our law, but that is a discussion you have to reserve for another day. Now, so in my view, if, a funda, if the right to property, what is then the right to property? If you're going to read it liberally, well, there are rights to property even in the constitution, which are not uh, mentioned in article, in, the, in, in part two, under the fundamental rights section. Provision. For example, Article 147, which confers 
right to pension. That has been interpreted by the Indian Supreme Court to include, to mean right of property. And if you interfere with that right, you commit a breach of Article 13.1. This point we have just, has just been argued before the Court of Appeal last week, and uh, judgment has been reserved to the 29th of October. I'll just read paragraph 31 of this judgment in the case of Deokanindan Prasad. Deokanindan Prasad against the state of Bihar. The question whether the pension granted to a public servant is property attracting Article 31.1, that is our Article 13.1, came up for consideration before the Punjab High Court in Bhagwan Singh and Union of India. It was held that such a right constitutes property and any interference with the breach of Article 31.1 of the Constitution. So property there includes another right given by the Constitution in another article. So for that reason, employment has been held to be property by our courts. The right to life is said to include after Tantik Singh, after the seminal judgment in Tantik Singh, the turning point, the, our courts have held that the right to property is, sorry, right to employment is property. So lawyers with a contract of employment with your firms, please remember this. Uh, if I could just refer to what we said in the case of Liu Fuk Chuan, I think all this material has been sent to everyone. Uh, at page 510, we say it cannot be gainsaid. 510. It cannot be gainsaid, paragraph C. It cannot be gainsaid that Parliament intended to elevate the status of a workman as defined by the, in the Act, this is the Industrial Relations Act, from the weak and subordinate position assigned to him by the common law to a much stronger position. The legislature has willed that the relationship of employer and workman is resting on a mere a consensual basis that is capable of termination by the employer at will with the, with the meager comp compensation consequence of paying the hapless workman a paltry sum as damages should be altered in favor of the workman. It has accordingly provided for security of tenure and equated the right to engage in gain, gainful employment to a proprietary right which may not be forfeited save and except for just cause or excuse. Due recognition of this higher status must therefore be accorded by our courts if they are to act in obedience to the will of parliament. <clears throat> so, in this case, we held the Court of, Court of Appeal that uh, the right to work, not only not is a fundamental right, the right to employment uh, is a proper right of, right of property. Of course, there, the deprivation of property is uh, compensatable by money. Our courts have consistently held courts across the Commonwealth have consistently held that uh, the fundamental, that the rights conferred in a constitution, constitutional rights in a written constitution uh, are to be given, are to be treated as value added rights. And the high level watermark of that is the majority speech of Lord Hutton in the case of Cullen against the Chief Constable of Ulster Constabulary, which we cited, which I cited in my dissenting judgment in the Inkim, Inkim Moy case. If I could look at, share Inkum, In, Inkim Moy with you, paragraph 63, in Cullen, the House of Lords by majority held that no damages could be recovered for a private by a private citizen for damage caused to him by a breach of a statute by a public authority, though the position was different if what was violated was a fundamental right guaranteed by the Constitution. Lord Hutton, who delivered the principal majority speech of the House said, and I won't read all of it, I could come down, scroll down to the last paragraph of the quotation. Therefore, where a right is contained in a written Constitution, 
where a right is contained in a written constitution, it is accorded a special value by the courts. And a breach of that right without damage or harm can lead to an award of damages. In other words, the breach, the violation of a constitutional right is actionable per se. That's why trespass is actionable per se. Action, uh, sorry, a violation of, the con of a constitutional right is actionable per se. This uh, is actually the culmination of a long line of cases, beginning with the case of Maharaj against the Attorney General of Trinidad, number two, and up to uh, D, uh, up to Basu against the uh, state of West Bengal. And uh, Nilabati Behra, preceded by Nilabati Behra against uh, uh, state of Orissa, then uh, Basu against the state of West Bengal, DK Basu against the state of West Bengal. In South Africa, we have the case of Fose against the Minister for Safety and Security, and in New Zealand, Simpson against the Attorney General. All of these cases followed the Supreme Court decision in Nilabati Behra. I'll just take two minutes to explain Nilabati Behra very quickly. Nilabati Uh, I was fortunate because the facts of that case were explained to me by the man who wrote the judgment, Justice Anand, who later became Chief Justice of India. <clears throat> Nilabati was a hawker. Her son, she was a widow. Her son, who was helping her, <clears throat> was arrested by the police. And taken away. Several days later, his dead body was recovered on the railway tracks. On the railway track. The police surgeon conducted a superficial post-mortem and held and, and gave a report saying that the death was, all injuries were post-mortem. In other words, that he had committed suicide by throwing himself on the track in the face of a, an oncoming uh, train. When Nilabati went to the coroner's court, there the coroner in India <coughs> has to issue a sudden death report before the body can be claimed from the mortuary. One of the lawyers there advised her not to accept it. <coughs> and uh, told her to write a letter uh, to the Chief Justice of India, which she did. That letter was treated <clears throat> as a writ petition and the Supreme Court issued notice to the state of Orissa, which raised, raised several defenses. In the end, directions were given. The first direction was that the Sessions Court, I beg your pardon, that the <clears throat> a fresh post-mortem should be conducted by the city civil surgeon and that the police surgeon should be excluded from that post-mortem <laughs> and that <clears throat> the uh, results of the post-mortem should be sent for an inquiry to be conducted by the coroner. The Sessions Court Sessions judge for the district was appointed as coroner. The report from the coroner showed that the death, that the injuries that caused the death were all anti litem mortem. In other words, preceding death, not post litem mortem, not <clears throat> post mortem, were anti mortem. So the Supreme Court then ordered the state to pay this lady compensation on the basis of strict liability for violating her right to life because by depriving her of her son, and by depriving her of her son, the state had deprived her of a livelihood since he was helping her in her uh, 
uh, hockey stall. <clears throat> now, uh, as I said, Nilabati has been followed throughout the Commonwealth. And here in our country, the federal court has unfortunately said that exemplary damages cannot be awarded for custodial death because of the Civil Law Act. That is a topic we cannot discuss today. We have to do it with some other day. So the remedy for prima facie remedy for breach of a right of property which would appear is monetary, but in my, my view, specific relief could also lie. For example, if taking the facts of the case that was decided by my brother, Isham Mudin, if it had been correctly decided by the federal court and his judgment had been correctly upheld instead of being wrongly reversed, uh, the federal court could have made an order directing the state to return the land uh, to its owners, to the farmers, because the nine year delay was unreasonable. Or in this case, that the, because form A was not issued, there had been breach of violation of written law. It was mandatory. I mean, I can't understand how they can hold the word shall to be directory unless you rewrite the English language. But anyway, that's what the federal court said. It said that it reversed my learned brother's uh, judgment and held that shall means may. And uh, that it is not necessary for the state to issue form A before it acquires the land. But had they acted correctly and sensibly, and had they upheld the judgment of my learned brother's court, they would have been able to issue an order directing the state to return the land to its true owners. This despite the prohibition in section 29, the proviso to section 29 of the Government Proceedings Act. That is a topic we have to discuss another day because we are not sure whether that's a provi those provisos are actually constitutional at all. In any event, judicial review proceedings would lie for the recovery of the land because by definition in the Government Proceedings Act, civil proceedings do not include those proceedings which if brought in England would be brought on the Queen's side of the, on the Crown side of the Queen's Bench Division. In 1956, that is when the Government Proceedings Act was enacted, the only proceedings that could be brought on the Crown side of the Queen's Bench Division were the prerogative remedies. So the definition of civil proceedings does not include uh, uh, judicial review. In today's context, judicial review. So that uh, if a person is deprived of his land, there is nothing to pre prevent the court from ordering and directing a return of it, in addition to constitutional compensation, if the need arises in appropriate cases. So to sum up my uh, comment for this evening, first, the right to property is to be wide, widely interpreted, and we have interpreted it widely. And secondly, uh, the violation of a right to property is compensatable usually by an award of money, monetary compensation. And thirdly, that rule is a flexible rule that in appropriate cases, even specific relief can go to assist the person who has been deprived of his property. I now stand ready for cross-examination. Thank you very much, Dato Sri. We have two, we have a number of questions from the floor, but before I yield the floor to the audience, I myself have a few questions for both our very distinguished speakers today. Um, my first question will be directing to the case of Slango pilot. In the federal court, the court said that uh, any deprivation would automatically violate some uh, cost to if they didn't provide adequate compensation. 
But in Privy Council, the Privy Council ruled that there is a distinction between deprivation and compulsory acquisition. So my question is, is the distinction between deprivation and compulsory acquisition an artificial distinction? I will... Who, 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 I will yeah, I leave it to my brother Hisham to answer first before I put in my two cents worth. <laughs> yes, um, my my view is that um, the word deprive deprive is w wider than the acquisition or use, meaning that not all deprivation of property will result in acquisition or use of property. So when the government um, acquire, acquires, uh, when, when, the, uh, the, uh, when the, uh, the state deprives a person of a property, um, it does not automatically end in acquisition or use. And this means that it does not automatically result in being compensation. That's the, the, just my view. Oh, I disagree. <laughs> oh, what, what's the, the basis? word deprivation. You see, in fact, all this is academic. After Nordin's case, after Dewan, Dewan Undangan agree and Nordin, all this is uh, academic because the test is no longer whether uh, there is actual deprivation or violation. The question is whether there is an impact on the fundamental right. So if you deprive a person of his property, you can deprive him in many ways, including by acquiring it. Uh, Judge Shisham, do you have anything in response? He disagrees with me vehemently. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, so Judge Shisham is not exercising the right to reply. Uh, so. We'll move on to an interesting question that Judge Hisham asked just now. So uh, the question is whether in the Selangor pilot case, whether the majority in the Privy Councils is correct or Lord Salman's dissenting judgment is correct. Uh, judge Hisham's question to the audience was, uh, we are to be the judge to decide who is giving a better judgment. So. I'm throwing the question back to Judge Hisham. Uh, Judge Hisham, uh, whose judge do you think is a better one? Well, if I have to answer the question, my answer will be that I am with a federal court uh, yeah, in that case, and I'm with the dissenting judge, Lord Salman, in that case. I, I think there was a, a deprivation, an indirect, an indirect way of depriving the accession of its goodwill, not directly, but indirectly a deprivation, uh, taking away of the goodwill from the accession did take place. And therefore, there, there, there was a, a violation of clause two and, and the a compensation was payable. Yeah. Three, uh... I agree. I agree. I agree. I thought. Uh, Sun uh, Safian got it. That Lord President Safian got it right, and Dilhan got it. Dilhan got it wrong. So, so it's a backdoor way of trying to take away the business goodwill by restricting the association from doing. Something. Well, if you call good, if you say goodwill is property, and the goodwill has ceased to exist as a result of the legislation, then there must have it can't disappear into thin air. Somebody must have taken it away. That, that, that is a point that was not uh, covered yeah. in the judge. I think that's, that's a very good point, Dr. Sri. I agree. So, so moving on to the next uh, question that I have for Dr. Sri Gopashi Ram. Uh, is natural justice, in, in most of the judgments cited earlier today, the judge, the court take the position that natural justice is best served if the government gives reasons for that decision. But how do we balance the competing interests of natural justice and the policy consideration of 
not overwhelming the government? How do we balance that? Well, courts cannot balance it because the common law rule is that there are no, there is no need to give reasons. An administrative, an administrator need not give reasons. That is the common law. That's the law. That's the rule we still continue to enforce. But we have carved out exceptions in some cases where, for instance, the person affected asks for an oral hearing and he is refused. The federal court has held in those circumstances there is a duty to give an afford an oral hearing and to hear the man. So in the same way, they've, they've carved out exceptions where there's been deprivation of a person's reputation, you might have to give reasons. And uh, if you deprive a person of his life, you might have to give reasons. Life here meaning the widest uh, meaning, carrying the widest meaning. But, uh, it is not for the courts to sort the problem. It is for Parliament. And the way to forward is for Parliament to enact something in the nature of the Tribunal and Inquiries Act 1958 in England, in the UK, which requires certain tribunals to give reasons, written reasons, contemporaneously with the decision. But as our law presently stands, there is no requirement to give reasons. And uh, there is no question of uh, posing a balance. If there is no reason, requirement to give a reason, the question of balancing it doesn't arise. That, that's a very good point, Dr. Sri, that policy consideration, uh, in, in, case, in terms of policy consideration, usually the parliament is the better judge in that respect. Yeah. Uh, there is a, sitting. <laughs> there's a few questions from the floor. So one last question from me. I shouldn't be... Uh, too selfish. One last question is... It's too late. You shouldn't have said that. <laughs> One last question, uh, if you indulge. Uh, so, in usual cases, tax is ordinarily imposed on compensation received. So, against this background, is the imposition of tax on adequate compensation under Article 13 unconstitutional because it diminishes the quantum of the compensation. So maybe Judge Hisham can let us have his thought first. Well, when a person is deprived of his property and a compensation is payable, it, it, uh, other clause to say must be paid adequate compensation. So my emphasis here is on the word adequate compensation. So the question is, is the compensation adequate? If you give a $10 and you take back $1 as tax and he got only $9, I don't think that that is adequate compensation. So, so when it is a compensation money, it is unconstitutional. To, to impose a tax on it. That's my view. It will be a, a violation of Article 13. Yeah. Dr. Sri, uh, do you have anything to add? I don't, think, I don't think it's possible to provide a straight answer because you see, income tax law legislation has been consistently held even by the Indian Supreme Court to be constitutional. So the question therefore turns on whether the land which was acquired from a business which normally trades in land so that the acquisition was nothing more than a sale, compulsory sale, and therefore tax should be paid. As against acquiring it from a, an owner who is not a businessman and who doesn't have to pay tax if he had sold the land. If he was outside the, air, the, the, the time limit specified by the Real Property Gains Tax Act, and he doesn't have to pay tax, then why should he be taxed on the compensation? Because compulsory acquisition, all that means is you have to compulsorily sell your land to the state. That is all it means. You have, instead of voluntary sale, you are being compelled to sell. So if it is a compulsory sale, then who is the seller? If the seller is a businessman who trades in land, and had he sold the land, in the ordinary course of business, he would have paid tax. 
Mm. So why should he not pay tax if the when if the purchaser happens to be the government? That is my answer. <laughs> I was initially quite convinced with Judge Hisham's uh, view, <laughs> but when Dato Sri Gopal Sri Ram offered his view, I tend to sway a bit. <laughs> Judge Hisham, do you have anything to add? No, no. no. <laughs> okay, um, we'll now move to the question from the floor. Uh, there's one question, I think it's directed to uh, Dato Sri Gopal Sri Ram. The question is, how is the right to employment a right to property? The right to work and earn a living entitles you to survive. A house entitles you to live in it. Uh, a car entitles you to uh, uh, to uh, mode of transportation. All these are property. The difference is that they are tangible, but right to employment is intangible. But to work and earn a li livelihood must be equated to property in order to enforce the right of the worker. Otherwise, the purpose of passing the Industrial Relations Act would be set at naught. I, I think uh, Dato Sri has raised a very good point, as was highlighted by the speakers earlier, that property should be given the widest meaning to include intangible property as well. So in that sense, the right is the intangible property. I, I hope that answers the question. Uh, there's a few more questions. Um, the question is, if there is an inordinate delay in holding an inquiry, resulting in an infringement of Article 13, can there be an alternative remedy or damages compensation based on market value? Can there be an alternative of, you know, instead of quashing it, but allowing a compensation? Uh, Shang? Well, that exactly happened in the Slango a pilot case. By the time it went up to the Privy Council, four years has elapsed from the date of the uh, government took over uh, the business and uh, the judgment given by the, 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 uh, the, the uh, no, no, uh, by the time it reached uh, the federal court. Yeah. So at the federal court, the, uh, the court accepted that uh, the argument that the acquisition was unconstitutional. Yeah. But the, Association was not interested in you know restore, restoring back uh, the Palitish uh, business to them. By that time, they've already uh, sold off uh, their uh, launches and the equipments to the government. Yeah, they've already ceased operation, and so all they they, they were interested was damages. So they say, although unconstitutional, we don't want our business back. You know, keep the business, put our authority, uh, keep the business, government keep the business, but give us damages instead. And the federal court says, yes, we will award damages and make an order that the matter be reverted back to the high court for damages to be assessed. So there the, the could be you know, the alternative remedy of of damages, yeah. So, so the short answer is there could be an alternative for, for compensation. Uh, number three, is there anything to add? That's what we did in Zagong Tasi. We said that the Aborigines had been deprived of their land, but since the land had already been used for public purpose, we ordered the uh, state to pay compensation at a higher level, not at the uh, not at the rate prescribed by the Aborigines or Act ordinance, but by a higher at a higher level. Because a, a innocent third party has by that time already entered the land. I won't say innocent, but third party. <laughs> All right, Dr. Sri. Um, we we have we have passed our time a bit, so we have time for one last question on the from the floor. So the question is: following a recent decision, 
the, the audience did not specify one division. The question is, is the land acquisition compensation valuation now valued by government agency or professional valuer at landowner's option? I think the audience is trying to ask, does the landowner has an option of choosing a valuation either by government agency or by professional valuer? Thus, the landowner has the option. Uh, Dr. Sri, would you like to go first? That's not a, that's a question which has no answer. Because <laughs> when the government fixes a value, that's the value. If you're not happy, you need evidence, you challenge the value, you go for the, the inquiry, land inquiry. My learned brother has held so many of them, he, should, he knows the ropes better than I do. And... Uh, <laughs> You just give the, you, you, you have assessors sitting with you and you look at the evidence and you see whether the, the government value has taken into account irrelevant considerations or omitted relevant considerations. The usual administrative law questions enter the fray and uh, then you make the award. So the question has no answer. Uh, Judge Nisha? When I was a, a high court judge, the, the system then was, um, we'll hear, for compensation, we'll hear um, the government valuers uh, who, who will um, make the valuation and, and give his reason for the valuation, arriving at some figure. And we'll hear the government uh, valuer, we'll hear the private valuer. And, and, but the ultimate decider will be the judge. Yes. And something happened in 1999. The government amended the law and says, it tied the hands of the judge. The value of the land will be what the valuers valued. Yeah, yeah. If the if um, the valuer concurred with one another, a private valuer, government they concurred, then that is the value. The judge has got no say. That was uh, what the amendment the amendment of 1996. But in the case where the, the, the private valuer says it's X ringgit, private value is X ringgit, government value is Y ringgit, then the judge be the decider. Then comes the case of Semanya Jaya, you know, drop the bombshell, you know, that says section 40 is unconstitutional, you know, Section 40 takes away the judicial power of ju judiciary. How could a, a parliament tie the hands of the, the, um, the judge? Yeah? Yeah. Judicial power is a basic structure of the constitution. So, mm. so, so, so the court says no, section 40 is unconstitutional. So I suppose now we are back to the earlier practice, you know, the the, the private valuer makes his judgment, the, the government valuer makes judgment, and the judge is the final arbiter. That's my, my quick answer. Thank you. I, I, yeah, thank you, uh, Judge Shishao and Dr. Sri. I think the short answer to this is, uh, as stated by two speakers, is that uh, it ultimately depends on the judge because where there is a dispute between two valuers, ultimately the judiciary is the arbiter that has to make the decision. I think uh, with that, we will uh, conclude our talk today. Uh, we would like to extend our greatest gratitude to Dr. Sri Kapoor and Judge Hisham for sparing your time with us today. Uh, you've been with us for more than almost one and a half hour now. Uh, thank you very much. And please stay tuned to our, the next of our series, which uh, uh, Judge Hisham will be speaking with uh, Professor uh, Dr. Asmi on the right to education. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Sri. Thank you, thank Judge you. Hisham. And I'm your moderator, Hayden. Thank you. Uh, we hope to see you, you. next time. Thanks, Dr. Sri.